This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, great, thanks. So it's great to be here today. Uh, once again, I'm Troy Building, professor, visiting associate professor in Matt's laboratory uh, <coughs> from Brazil. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about, uh, here are my uh, topics and objectives. I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about uh, agriculture in Brazil and also in the Amazon. Uh, I'm going to get into a little bit about cover crops, uh, the actual situation uh, right now, and then the need for cover crops in uh, agricultural systems in the Amazon. I'll talk about a pearl, uh, an analysis of pearl mill, a meta-analysis rather that I did. Uh, I just finished the first draft uh, on the use of pearl mill in the agricultural systems in the Amazon. Then I'll get into some present and future work in Brazil that uh, that we're doing. And then we'll have the closing comments. So probably, as many of you know, Brazil's an agricultural uh, leader in the world. They, uh, the country was uh, a net uh, importer of food grains in the 70s, and it was considered to be sort of backward in terms of agriculture, whereas now today it's a powerhouse. Uh, agribusiness, I think in 2017, was responsible for uh, around 40% of exports and maybe a third of GDP. And every year, uh, a large percentage of the growth in GDP comes from agribusiness in Brazil. If we look at this figure here, uh, we can see that for a lot of the commodities, the rank in world production value increased during the period from 1970 to 2017, increased quite a bit, especially for uh, chicken, for meat from cattle, soybeans, uh, Brazil is one of the world's largest exporters in all these products, probably the larger producer and exporter of oranges, coffee. So it is a world leader. Production and total factor productivity have, have more than doubled during this period. And part of that is due to the increase in area of, especially soybeans during the period from 1970 to 2017. Area of soybeans increased 70% and corn increased by 30%. Brazil is also a world leader in no-till agriculture. We can see here that, here we go, the area under no-till in 2007 and 2008 was about 25 and a half million hectares. It's about 65 million acres. And there was a 20% increase during about the last 10 years. Uh, and today, uh, they have about 81 million acres under no-till. About 70% of all uh, cultivated land in Brazil is under no-till agriculture. So that's really something that uh, Brazilian farmers are sold on. Uh, they really believe that no-till is one of the foundations to make uh, agriculture sustainable. So now I wanna explain a little bit about um, how things have changed uh, in recent years. The, first of all, the uh, savanna or cerrado in Portuguese biome or ecosystem uh, is where a lot of this increase in agriculture has occurred in Brazil and still is increasing. It's a huge area, uh, larger than California and Alaska combined. We can see the image here. That's in green. That's the cerrado. About half of it is deforested and there was a large uh, increase in agricultural land use between 2000 and 2014. So, so what has happened is that farmers have uh, basically migrated from the south of Brazil up through the Cerrado, and now during the last 10, maybe 15 years, farmers have migrated into the Amazon to where I'm located. And that's considered to be one of the agricultural frontiers in Brazil today. Um, so capitalized farmers are making this migration today uh, due to, there's a lot of factors involved, but basically it has to do with cheaper land. So the geographic area, uh, the, the focus of my talk, of a lot of things I'm gonna talk about today uh, is Western Pará. So if we look here, this is 
the legal Amazon, okay? And then the state of Pará is here. I'm located right about here in this region. That's the Tapajós River at the confluence of the Amazon River. And then these areas in red uh, show basically the region that I'm referring to as Western Pará, which is more or less this region here. Okay, so what's the most important, uh, on a large scale at least, um, agricultural activity in this region of the Amazon? It's soybeans followed by corn. Okay. Uh, what happens is that soybeans are planted uh, sometime usually around the end of December, beginning of January. It depends on the year, the climate. And then they're harvested sometime around the end of April, uh, mid-May something like that. After the harvest, corn is planted. It's called the second crop corn, or safrinha in Portuguese. And this allows farmers to, uh, to harvest two crops on the same piece of land during one season. Okay? So that's planted immediately after the soybeans are harvested. So if the soybeans are harvested at the beginning of May, just a couple days after, so the uh, corn is planted. And then it's harvested sometime around the end of August, the beginning of September. So farmers can get two crops. So then looking at these dates, you know, these periods of time, these months, the question is what about August, September through December, January? What about that more or less four month period? What happens then? And that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit today. Um, <clears throat> here, I wanted to put into context the importance of uh, agriculture to the economy in this region of the Amazon. We can see here some statistics on the production chain of soybeans and corn in this region. Uh, this industry is responsible for about 5,000 direct, indirect jobs. Uh, there are about 240,000 acres of soybeans and corn planted every year in the region. And that's responsible for about $60 million each year in financial transactions. So this puts into context the magnitude of what's going on on this agricultural frontier. Land use change. Here's some figures from a PhD student with whom I worked. We can see here the dynamics of land use change in the region. We've got three of the most important municipalities <clears throat> in the region, Mojui, Belterra, and Santarém. And the land use changed from 2001 to 2014. And as you'll see, uh, land use change, the direction of things is very different in each place. Uh, for example, 61% during the period, 61% of land use change was forest and pasture to agriculture in Mojui. Uh, here in Belterra, 90% or more was forest and agriculture going to pasture. And then in Santarém, 84% was forest that got converted to agriculture and pasture. So I think one of the reasons for this is it has to do with uh, prices uh, for commodities on international, national and international markets. And farmers have the flexibility to uh, year to year, they can turn a pasture into a soy field or vice versa. Uh, a lot of times what'll happen is if soy prices go up, a farmer will rent out his land for two or three years to a neighboring farmer that has the capacity, the equipment and the knowledge and everything to uh, grow soybeans. So that's an interesting dynamic in the region. So let's get into a little bit about cover crops here now. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that's been going on in the last few years there is uh, interseeding of Congo grass as a cover crop mulch for no-till planting. So here we've got images uh, from December of this year, of 2018, sorry. Uh, showing the dried uh, Congo grass just before uh, soybean planting. And what happens is that this grass is interseeded. It's, it's either interseeded uh, within the rows of soybean uh, just a few weeks before harvest, or it's interseeded into the second crop corn when the corn gets to be maybe about 15 centimeters or so. Uh, the advantages of the Congo grass are that it has a rapid establishment uh, that it has a high sensi sensitivity to desiccation, which is really good for uh, no-till mulch. 
and uh, the cattle can be grazed on it. So after harvesting the second crop corn, you can bring cattle in there. The, the harvesting, when you harvest the second crop corn, the grass will shoot right up. The cattle can come in, graze on that, and also on the corn residuals. Some of the disadvantages of the, the, the use of Congo grass are that it has a high susceptibility to pests. Uh, Sigahinia is the name, I think it's spittlebug here, and um, <clears throat> has low drought resistance. And that's something that I'm gonna talk about uh, just in, in another slide coming right up. So here's an image of no-till planting uh, in January this year. Uh, that's the Congo grass uh, mulch with the uh, soybean being planted in. And then this is about a month later. You can see the mulch on the ground here uh, with soybeans growing quite well. And in the background, that's a, a castanheira. That's a Brazil nut tree. Um, so what you'll see down there is, are these huge fields that go out sometimes through the horizon and they'll be interspersed with these lone huge trees sitting all by themselves, the Brazil nut tree, because you can't cut them down. So it's kind of a neat thing to see. It makes for, for an interesting visual. So here we are with uh, soybeans about uh, two months after planting, the end of March of this year, growing quite well, uh, very vigorous. And, and looking at the, uh, this image here, it makes you sort of think that, well, the Congo grass really serves as a cover crop. It's doing its job. Uh, and that may be the case, but the thing is that these guys, these farmers, these guys are, are, are planting this Congo grass um, based on what happens in Mato Grosso in, in, in the Cerrado. So uh, it's sort of empirical. There's no uh, uh, experimental basis for this just yet. So that leads me naturally to conclude that there are lots of unknowns, therefore a great need for diversification of cover crops in the region. For example, uh, farms with little, uh, farms with no cattle don't need to use pasture grass as cover. Um, then the other thing I thought about is, does this Congo grass, does it really, does it make sufficient mulch, biomass mulch for the no-till crop? Uh, what, what are the effects of it on cash crop yield? Does it contribute to the yield of the cash crop? Uh, pest resistance, potential for intercropping, other uses such as uh, uh, seeds. Can we use this for, uh, as a seed bank? And then what about uh, drought tolerance? And, and in our region, uh, that's a big deal. And I'm gonna explain that here now. So climate and water balance are, are gonna be really important in terms of decision-making about what cro cover crops we're gonna use. You can see here, we've got an image uh, of the Brazilian Amazon with the Koppen uh, classification uh, colored in. This is from a publication of colleagues of mine from Embrapa. Here's uh, Para, and the arrow, arrow points to where I'm located. So our region is a mix of uh, AM3 and AM4. So that means we get a pretty strong dry season in this region. And we can see here, looking at the water balance figure that I made here, from 1990 to 2018, millimeters of rainfall and average temperature here, the line is the average temperature. So the blue is the rainfall, the green is the excess, and then the red is uh, the deficit that exists. And if you look at the figure, you can see the deficit, available water deficit begins sometime around the end of July. It's really strong for a couple of months and then begins to diminish uh, towards the end of December. So this period is uh, a really important uh, moment in terms of the agricultural year, the agricultural cycle. And, and, and this is sort of what I'm gonna talk about uh, in terms of cover crops here. There's another factor here uh, uh, that's really important to take into account. And uh, besides our natural seasonal variation, we're having um, problems with droughts in the region. Uh, we've had droughts 2005, 15, uh, 10, and 15, pretty severe droughts that uh, appear to get longer in duration and more severe. So these figures from a 2018 publication here uh, show uh, monthly precipitation. Well, let me first explain here. The dashed line is the 16-year average from 2000 to 2016. The solid line is what happened in 2015 and 16. So We've got monthly precipitation here by satellite and by rain gauges, and both show 
uh, a decrease of 16, 17% in rainfall during the period 2015, 2016. And the gauges showed a decrease of 16% compared to the 115 year average. So this is a big deal. Um, actually during uh, December, January, February of 2015, 16, Pastures caught on fire, um, roadsides were on fire, forests caught fire, uh, cattle were breaking down barbed wire fences to get into greener pastures. So um, this is real, we're seeing this down there. Um, here we have temperature, it was 0.7 degrees Celsius above the 16 year average. Vapor pressure deficit, same thing, higher. And then the maximum climatological uh, water deficit shows, uh, a very large deficit that basically continued all the way through this whole period. So in other words, when the rains came, finally, uh, there was still a, a large deficit because it was the, the deficit was so strong in the previous months. So seeing this and, and thinking about this um, made me think, you know, that this, is, this shows that uh, there is a great need for incorporation of drought resistant cover crops during the follow period between cultivation of uh, cash crops. Here's an image uh, of the drought, so we can see this. This demonstrates clearly what happened. The, uh, due to the drought, planting of soybeans were delayed three months or so. Um, we can see here, at the end of May 2015, we were doing a soil sampling on this day and soybeans were harvested. And then we can see here about a year later, uh, May 12, 2016, soybeans were basically just planted. So due to the drought, everything got delayed. And what ended up happening is that the second crop corn wasn't planted that year. So what does that mean? That means that farmers lost out economically. They didn't plant, they didn't harvest. Not just that, there's an opportunity cost involved, meaning that farmers left fields bare during the dry season when they could have gone in there and planted some kind of cover crop that would have enhanced soil fertility and, and brought other benefits, they didn't do it because of the drought. So everything just laid bare. So that's one of the concrete effects that you can see right here due to uh, droughts uh, in the region. So then uh, the strong uh, uh, dry season and the question of droughts requires the use of a drought resistant cover crop. And if we look at the figure again, our water balance figure here, millimeters of rainfall, temperature, we've got uh, rainfall, excess, and deficit here. So soybeans are planted somewhere around the end of December in a normal year. Harvest occurs sometime in April, mid-April or so. Uh, soon afterward, the second crop is planted and then the second crop is harvested sometime generally in August. Okay, and that gives us this period here, what I call the window of opportunity when a drought resistant cover crop could be introduced to improve soil fertility and um, generate mulch for no-till. So I've got this period here. And we have to also take into account climate models. Climate models uh, demonstrate uh, generally that droughts will become more frequent rainfall will become more intense uh, during the wet season and there'll be longer periods of uh, dry periods with no rain. So taking all this as a whole, thinking about it, what might be an adequate species of cover crop to put in in this period here? Well, first of all, um, <clears throat> I wanna say that in, uh, the use of cover crops in general across the Amazon is sort of insipid still. Um, it hasn't really taken hold just yet. Uh, an example of this is this uh, map from CONABI, which is an agency that is responsible for generating statistics and data about agricultural production in the country. Uh, this is from July 18, and it's for sorghum. So we can see here in the, uh, the great majority of the, uh, uh, the Amazon region, there's nothing, nothing for sorghum. The thing is though, um, I know for a fact personally, that there is sorghum planted in, uh, in the Amazon in our region. I've seen it, know the farmers, and <clears throat> I talked to the president from the rural syndicate in uh, January, and he said uh, he knows the farmers, he knows the farms, 
He said, yeah, there's sorghum here. There might be a thousand hectares, but there's sorghum. So on a macro scale, you won't see this. On a more local scale, you'll find uh, the use of cover crops. So then <clears throat> back in the fall, I started thinking about what it is I wanted to do in terms of writing and, and researching something. And of course I had an idea, well, you know, I'll look at about 50 species of cover crops and write about them and their potential for, for use in the Amazon. And, and that became, became pretty evident uh, very soon that I couldn't do that. Uh, once I started to narrow down my focus and really think about what it is I wanted to say, um, it became obvious that even writing about maybe three or four species would be tough. Um, but at any rate, some of the species I found here are still sansis, uh, they call it stilo uh, in Brazil. I think it might be called pencil flower here. Um, Crotalaria, uh, that's what they call it there. Uh, I think about four species that are used uh, in Brazil. Uh, sun hemp is what I've seen there. Um, sorghum, jack bean, a couple of different pasture grasses, and then pearl millet. So realizing that I could only use just one species for this, uh, for this uh, analysis I did, I opted to use pearl millet. Um, and the title of the paper, uh, the first draft here, is the use of pearl millet as a cover crop species in Amazonian agroecosystems to promote sustainable agriculture, um, a descriptive meta-analysis. So then why uh, P. glaucum? Basically because it appears to have characteristics that make it suitable for use in these systems down in the Amazon. <clears throat> and some of these characteristics are that it's uh, drought resistant, deep rooted, it's a C4 plant, so it's adapted to tropical uh, biomes systems. It's capable of a large biomass production, which is important for no-till. Um, it's a nutrient recycler. It can be used as a grain or forage crop. Seeds are relatively cheap and easily available. And also because <clears throat> I personally know that this is being used in the region, in the Amazon too. I've seen it there. Um, there might be a thousand hectares of it once again, maybe less. So uh, what, are the, what are the aspects then that I decided to look at in terms of the use of pearl millet as a cover crop? Well, there are a bunch of them here. Um, I'm gonna just focus on these four in bold. Uh, the potential for biomass generation, residue decomposition, nutrient cycling, and the effect on the uh, cash crop yield. And I also looked at some others, uh, soil C inputs, uh, percentage of soil coverage and uh, weed control, potential as a forage, cash, or seed crop, and drought resistance. So the overarching question here is what are the possible contributions to the resilience and the sustainability uh, in Amazonian agroecosystems, okay? And you'll see that I call this a meta-analysis, uh, a descriptive meta-analysis. For those of you who are familiar with meta-analyses, uh, you probably know that you have to have a series of standard things uh, like um, uh, uh, risk of bias assessment, analysis of variation uh, among the studies that you use, probably some statistical analyses to predict things. I didn't do any of that. I just gathered uh, all the studies I could find that fit my criteria, which I'm gonna show, all the studies I could find, and then just reported averages, made averages and reported uh, variation associated with those averages. And I did a few simple uh, statistical tests too, t-tests. So. As far as the meta-analysis goes, study inclusion criteria, that's one of the basic things. So what are my criteria? First of all, um, <clears throat> the study had to be conducted in the Cerrado or the Amazon biome. Had to be done on an oxisol soil, and it had to be done in the field with no irrigation. So those are the uh, basic criteria that I used to include, exclude studies. Uh, since I found very few studies done in the Amazon. Uh, I think I found three. Uh, I used studies done on oxisol soils in the Cerrado as a proxy for conditions in the Amazon. And that's really not that big of a stretch if you think about it. Um, because both seasons have a really strong, uh, both uh, biomes have a really strong dry season during basically the same months. And there are a lot of oxisols there. The, the, 
lot of the agriculture is done on oxisols. Okay. So let's quickly look at some data here. Dry biomass generation, kilograms per hectare here. Uh, per millet on oxisols uh, in Brazil. And the studies I found were all between 95 and uh, 2018. So <clears throat> the number of studies here, looking at Brazil as a whole, without regard to soil type, biome or anything, found 78 studies. And the N here uh, is larger than the studies because uh, some studies had values for uh, these parameters, biomass here, for example. They had several values from different sites or different years. So I just included them as a sample. Uh, found three studies for the Amazon and 43 for the Cerrado. So these values, to put it into context, in the literature, what's established in the literature is, is six megagrams here, that's just 6,000 kilograms per hectare as being necessary to establish no-till in Brazil. So then our values here for the Cerrado are well above that. And for the Amazon, it approaches six. Since we only have three studies, you have to take that as a grain of salt, with a grain of salt. Uh, but over half of the studies that I found for the dry biomass were greater than six for the Sahara and the Amazon. So that shows that uh, pearl millet has the potential to create what can be considered sufficient dry biomass uh, on these oxal soils in seasonally dry ecosystems. So then nutrients. Here we're looking at nutrients in the biomass, the dry biomass. So here we have nutrient content at zero, 60, and 120 days after desiccation. And this is for pearl millet that was grown for 60 days and also grown for 180 days. Okay, so we've got two different periods for, for which it was grown. And what we see here, kilograms per hectare, is that basically for pearl millet grown for 60 days, nitrogen, potassium, uh, phosphorus, and potassium are greater than for pearl millet grown for 180 days. So there's more nutrients in these plants uh, when they're desiccated basically at flowering than if you let them mature and set to seed. So that's an interesting result that I'll explain a little more that um, has implications for management of pearl millet in these systems. So then what about release of the nutrient? So it's in the biomass, what about release? Well here we can see that the uh, uh, release of NPK by pearl millet biomass can be equal to the nutrients that are exported in the cash crop. So looking here at soybeans and corn, the amount of nutrients exported in four and six megagrams of these on oxisol soils in the Cerrado, here we can see the nutrient content that's released after 60 days of decomposition. So that's the end of these orange bars. And seeing these data from the studies I gathered, we can see that Pearl millet has the potential after 60 days of decomposition to replace nutrients that are exported uh, in soybeans and corn. So that's a pretty positive result. Then the half-life of biomass, the uh, studies had an average biomass of 36 for the CN ratio. So that shows that it's probably a slower as far as de decomposition goes. Uh, half-life is about 109 days and then nutrients at more or less the 60 here, 60 days, the red line, nutrients are all pretty much near 50% uh, or uh, uh, more here. So that's a pretty good result. If, you know, after 60 days of decomposition, there's still um, a lot of nutrients left in the biomass and there's also a lot that's uh, 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 released to the soil. That's a good result for nutrient cycling. So then what about <clears throat> transfer then to the soil, the enrichment of the soil uh, by the pearl millet biomass. So here we have studies that had data for uh, to 20 centimeters for nutrients transferred after 60 days of decomposition. And I had studies, well, these are the studies I found. This is the pearl millet and the control. Uh, there were no um, statistical difference in the, the T test I did here, but what we can see is that pearl millet is able to transfer large amounts of nutrients to the soil. And when we think about cultivation, intensive cultivation on oxisols, low fertility oxisols, this is an important result because 
uh, sustainability, sustainability of uh, agricultural activities on these soils uh, is going to partially uh, be related to, uh, be a function of rather, uh, the ability of plant species to absorb and efficiently release nutrients in labile forms. So that's an interesting result. And then more specifically, looking at the phosphorus as transferred to the soil here, we've got a table now, phosphorus availability for soils of the state of Pará. This is from Embrapa. This shows the percent clay and then the soil texture, clay to sandy. And here we have low to very high concentrations of uh, phosphorus in the soil. So remembering that the average P content transferred to the soil from pearl millet was about 73 milligrams per uh, decimeter cubed. This, looking at the table, we can, we can see that pearl millet has the potential to raise P levels to very high levels. So that could, uh, in theory, reduce the need for the use of phosphor fertilizer, uh, phosphorus fertilizer. And it's important to remember that oxisols are the soil order, it is the soil order, that uh, has the highest capacity for fixation of phosphorus. And in the Amazon, 34% of the soils are oxisols. And in my region, they're more highly concentrated, a little bit north and then south of the Amazon River in my region of Western Pará, uh, there's a huge percentage of oxisols in that region. So this is an important result. There's one caveat though, and that is <clears throat> that these data, uh, you know, 73 here for phosphorus, these data don't tell us anything about the way that pearl millet accesses phosphorus in the soil. If it's able to access uh, sources of phosphorus that are considered moderately label, and then leave them in more label forms, and which is really important for uh, phosphorus cycling. So that brings up a, a research question, which is basically how can we improve the availability of phosphorus in these agricultural soils, okay? Uh, the question is, are there plants such as pearl millet, pearl millet that can mine phosphorus, access forms that are moderately labile associated with iron and aluminum in the soil, and then release it in labile forms. One mechanism would be the release of organic acid anions by the roots into the rhizosphere, which would then compete for P absorption sites. So uh, that's an interesting research question. And those data that I, that I gathered uh, from the, the studies don't tell us anything about that. Uh, <clears throat> the idea would be to cultivate plants in controlled experiments and then do a sequential fractionation to try to extract the different fractions of soil phosphorus. And that would help us to understand the capacity for Puruma in this case to uh, affect changes in the sources and reserves of phosphorus in the soil. Okay, so last data slide here. What are the effects of pearl millet on cash crop yield? Okay, here we have kilograms per hectare and I found studies on rice, soybeans and corn. My sample sizes here. I didn't find any um, <clears throat> statistical differences with the simple t-tests. Uh, individual studies do show that there are effects actually, especially for rice. Pearl millet uh, does have an effect on yields uh, specifically associated with uh, the input, recycling rather, of phosphorus and potassium into the soil through the biomass. Um, however, a bunch of studies I saw that are reported on um, show that this effect of, of, of increase of cash crop yield is only possible with an input of inorganic nitrogen fertilizer. And one of the ways around that that I saw in, the, in these studies that I, I uh, I gathered was the question of intercropping, intercropping of pearl millet with species of crotalaria, sun hemp. And basically all the studies I saw uh, on the oxisols in the Cerrado, this intercropping resulted in higher yields, um, higher soil fertility, higher yields of the cash crop too. And that's because of the interaction between the end fixer, the sun hemp, and uh, the other benefits from the pearl millet. So that's a pretty interesting result too the question of intercropping. So to summarize some of this here, uh, <clears throat> the, object, the objective of the incorporation of a cover crop by a farmer um, is gonna determine, in this case, how pearl millet would be managed in these systems. For example, 
if the objective is just to create biomass for mulch, then you can just leave it basically. 130 days or so is its cycle. You can leave it to grow. Uh, as it grows and matures even more, it'll have a higher lignin concentration, which could be good for, uh, for uh, the biomass mulch. Now, remembering our available water balance figure here with the different periods of planting and harvest of soybeans in, in the second crop, we have the question here that if the, the objective is not just biomass uh, generation, but nutrient cycling, then the idea would be to try to synchronize the planting of pearl millet to maximize not just biomass, but nutrient transfer. And from the data that I was able to gather, that looks to be about 60 days of growth and 60 for decomposition, which fits nicely into this period here of the dry season, and the four months window during the dry season. Okay, so now transitioning to some present and, and future work in Brazil. First of all, um, <clears throat> Here's a map showing, once again, the legal Amazon with basically where I'm located right there. What we have is a, uh, we've got a 30 hectare uh, plot of land. It's a uh, degraded pasture. It's on a farm uh, called Jaguara. Uh, and what we want to do is create sort of a model farm, a demonstration farm, and an agricultural experiment uh, research station on this farm. The owner of this farm is a large animal veterinarian. Uh, he's a friend of mine. He's a university professor with me also. And uh, he specializes in, in bovine reproduction. And what he wants to do is create an intensive cattle ranching system where you've got rotations between pastures and crops. Uh, and you incorporate trees into the pastures and the crops. That's the integration crops, livestock, and forest which is a big deal uh, right now down in Brazil, slowly taking on in the Amazon region. So this is our plot of land here, degraded pasture. Uh, the farmer is uh, totally sold on uh, the idea of creating this project, this model farm. And uh, he's actually financed a good part of the work we've been doing for the last few years. So this is a really uh, great opportunity for us. The idea would be to create uh, sort of a system like this, which exists in Paragominas, which is a region far away in, in the uh, state uh, of Pará, in the eastern part of the state. <clears throat> so you've got trees here planted in rows with crops between the trees and pastures uh, with trees also. And then over time, you rotate all of this. Here's an example of soybeans with eucalyptus trees planted in the middle. Uh, our idea is actually to see if we can't plant on the topography following the contour lines in that 30 hectare plot of land that I showed. That's a, this is a, a, an image from a master student of mine uh, generated this image. So that's our idea is to do things a little bit differently. But the general idea is this, is to create an, uh, an integrated system where you have uh, crops and pastures being rotated, where you use cover crops, and also you can do experiments in these, uh, in these plots. Another experiment that was just started this year <clears throat> is uh, attempting to say something about the contribution of no-till agriculture compared to conventional agriculture in the Amazon. Uh, so how does that affect sustainability? And the idea is we have fields where uh, uh, no-till agriculture, soybeans, planted right next to conventionally planted soybeans. And that's replicated on five farms with the same soil type and site history, basically. And then we're going to look at crop productivity, soil productivity, and microclimate parameters to try to say something about no-till in Amazonian agroecosystems. Soil fertility sampling. We uh, did a, an intensive campaign of two years of soil uh, sampling in different sites, five different sites here uh, in the region integrated no-till crop pasture rotation, integrated no-till crop pasture forest, a managed pasture, a degraded pasture, and then native forest control. So two years of data, three seasons within each year, wet, dry, and transition, and 720 uh, total samples. 
So just to uh, show some quick photos here, the, uh, this is the no-till corn soybean pasture site. This is managed pasture. Here's the integration of crops, livestock, and forest. Uh, that forest is uh, noble species uh, of wood, um, mahogany, Brazilian teak, and a bunch of others. Can't remember now. Degraded pasture and then uh, primary forest. So I just wanted to just include this just to show uh, some of the things we've been doing. Uh, two years of data here, <clears throat> three different depths, pH in the managed sites has gone up compared to the native forest, and then potential acidity here has gone down in com uh, comparison to the uh, native forest. So in terms of availability of nutrients, nutrient cycling, that's a positive result. Same thing for cation exchange capacity and base saturation here. We can see our sites and the managed sites. Um, basically, cation exchange has gone up compared to the forest and uh, also base saturation. So once again, in terms of nutrient cycling, we can consider that a positive <coughs> result. More specifically, now looking at available soil phosphorus, what we have here in the managed sites, no-till crop pasture and the crop livestock forest, we have uh, two years of data showing there's more available phosphorus in these sites, 20 meters in the soil compared to uh, the other sites. Uh, so that's a really uh, interesting result. When you think about the problems with phosphorus availability in the soil and also the question of phosphorus, a more geopolitical uh, question of phosphorus reserves in the world. Um, and that'll only get more difficult for Brazil as time goes, of course. So concluding here, I have no idea about time. Is that clock right? Yeah? Okay. Uh, and um, <clears throat> wanted to talk about uh, a little bit about extension here uh, and knowledge flows amongst farmers. Uh, we do our group together with people from Embrapa, which are part of our group. We do these sort of workshops where we'll get out and talk to farmers. This is something I've seen here at Cornell and Matt Ryan's lab <clears throat> that apparently they do really well. Um, uh, get together with farmers in the field, talk about their work, show research, research results, uh, bring them here even. Uh, and I think that's really important to do. And the little bit I've done of this there has shown me that uh, there are a lot of benefits to knowing what it is that the people that are on the front line think. You know, what, what is their perception? In this particular workshop, we uh, wanted to know what they thought were their barriers to uh, sustainable agricultural activities. What are the barriers preventing them from planting trees and building a nursery and engaging in some of these activities on their, on, on their lands? So we sent out an invitation, um, doesn't appear too well here, uh, and we got a really good response. We uh, talked with about 20 soybean corn farmers and cattle ranchers. Some images here from the, from the, the event. The way it works is that we'll, uh, each member of our group will give a five minute, maybe 10 minute presentation on something that we're working on. And then we'll get together with the farmers. And it's sort of like a brainstorming session where they'll write down on small pieces of paper what they think are barriers and then we'll come up to the front of the room and put them on the board and tally everything up. And then what we end up creating is like a, a sort of a mental map of what this group thinks are barriers. And uh, in this case here, um, the most important of these factors here on the spider plot was a lack of land title. Um, probably isn't a big problem here, but in the Brazilian Amazon, it's a huge problem. A lot of farmers don't have title to the land. So if you don't have title, you really can't do a whole lot in terms of getting credit from a bank um, you know, to do some of these, uh, uh, incorporate some of these sustainable activities on your property. So they know about a lot of this stuff and they wanna do it, but without land title, it really makes things very difficult for them. So that was one of the most important things. The other was um, the lack of te technical assistance in the region. Uh, all the farmers uh, basically said that um, <clears throat> there's a big lack of, uh, of people that are qualified to guide them through uh, these sort of processes and techniques and things. So what they end up doing is, is within their community, they end up looking uh, to one person who they perceive as being uh, 
like the best of them. Uh, you know, they look up to this person. And in the case of this group, there is a farmer that they all mentioned that I know personally, this farmer. And they say, well, that guy, you know, he reads, he studies, he knows he, the literature and he's, he's able to incorporate new techniques into his uh, system. So if he does it, they'll look up to him. They'll actually uh, consult with him and, and maybe follow his lead even. And so for us as a research group, that's really important to know. Because if you, if you can maintain the communication line open with that one farmer who's perceived to be you know, the best, then you can, uh, that's sort of a conduit to be able to get to uh, the rest of the farmers. So that, that was an interesting uh, result for me, participating in these workshops. So to uh, summarize here then, uh, final comments. Um, I mentioned uh, that there was about a four month window, uh, dry season, where we could incorporate a drought resistant cover crop uh, to improve soil fertility, generate biomass for no-till. Uh, pearl millet uh, may be able to uh, fit this niche uh, because it's able to generate sufficient dry biomass and, uh, and also the question of 60 days of growth and 60 days of decomposition to liberate nutrients. Uh, if it's managed that way, it could fit the niche. Uh, the dry biomass values for no-till, um, combining those from the Amazon and the Cerrado, uh, we got a little more than six megagrams per hectare. The literature says six is sufficient to establish no-till in Brazil, but I question that. I put right here, why this value? Uh, the citation that I saw everywhere that everybody uses is from 2001, but I didn't, never saw anything about why six megagrams was, was established as the correct value. So that would need to be tested. Also, the idea would be to get out into the Amazon in general to different farms and document the use of cover crops in the region. Uh, that would involve a lot of traveling, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, also test several types of cover crops in controlled field experiments. The question of phosphorus cycling, the, the ability to access moderate labile reserves in the soil and make them labile, this transformation, phosphorus, is very interesting. That uh, should be investigated uh, for pearl millet. And then the uh, model experimental farm. Um, that's going to be something that's going to allow us to engage with farmers uh, over time to show them what we're up to, maybe show some new ideas and technologies, and find out. Uh, what their perceived difficulties are. Okay, acknowledgements. So <clears throat> I'd like to acknowledge CAPES. Uh, it's a uh, agency that's part of the Ministry of Education in Brazil. Uh, they funded my proposal to come here and stay for a year on a sort of sabbatical, I suppose it is. So thank you very much, CAPES. The uh, Cornell librarians, when I started this work, when I, my first idea was to do this grand uh, was it systematic review sort of thing. I went to the Mann Library and I sat a lot with the uh, uh, Cornell librarians and talked with them. Great group of people, really knowledgeable. Um, they, they really sat with me, helped me out quite a bit, showed me all the great resources that the library has. So thank you, Cornell librarians. Uh, Matt Ryan and the uh, SCL, I have to say thank you very much. Um, he's welcomed me with open arms since I've been here. Uh, I've learned a lot with them, even though we're from different areas, it doesn't matter. We're all here to learn, I suppose. Uh, so, you know, I thank them, uh, Matt, especially, very much. And then, of course, uh, finally, family. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, can't forget the family, all of us. It's the most important thing. My family uh, has been very uh, patient with me. You know, they've come to... Uh, a new place, a new culture, learn a new language, uh, and uh, they accepted the challenge 100% and uh, have been behind me the whole time that I've been here working, been in the library, preparing this talk, the paper and everything. So uh, we all can't forget our family. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think so, I don't know. Please. Oh, geez. Yeah. Um, well, there is a process. Uh, the thing is, it costs money, so a lot of people don't do it, um, first of all. Uh, it can be complicated, like a lot of things in Brazil. Uh, I think um, 
as long as there's no big conflict, of, like between two people who say they're the owner of the land, you can get it. It just takes um, a certain amount of resources and money to do it. And then that's not even the biggest issue with the farmers. They want to know what the benefits will be if they, if they get land title. And after they get it, they'll have to be in, uh, registered into the, um, there's a registry. I can't remember the name uh, right now. Um, but it's a national registry. And then they'll have an obligation to do a whole bunch of things with their land, geo-referencing and report to the government. Uh, they'll be monitored and this sort of thing. So a lot of the landowners just say, ah, to heck with it. Um, so it's not that they can't do it. Like I said, if, as long as there's no, there's no conflict between different landowners, they're open to do the process. It's just that um, sometimes they perceive that there really aren't that many benefits, even though they would be able to get credit from the bank. Please. With your, um, your, your crops in the dry season, you've got your 60 days, you're anticipating 60 days of growth and 60 days of decomposition. Um, but you also showed that over the last period, you've had perhaps four major droughts that pushed your crop then, perhaps even another 60 days down the road. Right. Um, so were you thinking about what is happening with that crop's decomposition at that time, whether or not you're sort of decreasing in the amount of nutrient recycling you'd be able to do, or whether or not that those decomposition products would end up on the soil complex again and, and not necessarily available? Well, I did show the- thinking about that drought, if you have an extended drought under this scenario. Actually, that's um, pretty, it's an interesting point to be able to incorporate into the first draft of the paper, which I didn't do. So um, that's interesting. I did show the figure, I think, of uh, <clears throat> 240 days of decomposition. Um, so I could actually go back, see those studies that went that far to see what the um, soil enrichment factor would be. Um, I'm going to try to remember that because that's actually pretty good. Yeah, thank you. Please. Uh, thanks a lot. Very interesting. Uh, with the sort of decomposition nutrient recycling component, it sounded like you were sort of targeting having nutrient availability when the next crop was planted. Um, I have two questions about that. One is, would you want that actually to be more at the time when the major nutrient uptake is by that crop? Which, you know. Oh, that would be hard to coordinate, I suppose. I mean, if you look well, at- Well, it would just give you yeah. a little longer time to grow the cover right. crop, right? It would just say, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe we want to grow it a little longer, you know, looking at that period of availability of the nutrients having more of an overlap with the uptake of the sub sex subsequent crop. The other kind of half of my question is, you know, with the, with the moisture cycle, have you thought about that affecting all the processes, you know, the growth and the decomposition? Um, like, were these crops planted during that part of the year? <laughs> I assume they were, but. You mean planted during the, during the dry, the dry period. Dry period. So, how would that affect? Well, just I guess the basic question is just where, with the studies you're looking at, were they all were the cover crops all planted during that dry period? Oh, right, right, right. Um, no, that's something also that I could I could look at to sort of shore up, uh, you know, uh, make stronger the the you know my case in in the paper. Um, that's actually pretty important. I need to see when these were planted to see in fact if they're actual during the real dry period. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm gonna look at that. I'm gonna write these down mentally, I guess. <laughs> Jeez. Was there one? Please. Yeah, so um, again, really interesting. The, um, you kind of alluded to the fact that, that you might want to combine the pearl millet with the like you, like uh, Sun Ham. Um, so why, why did you not, I mean, in the end, you didn't kind of come back to that. But would that make sense, even if you follow it with soybean and maybe that might boost the soybean yields a little bit? Or, I mean, well, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, well, that, I mean, I probably should have, not just here, but also in the paper, expanded on that. Um, the paper was already it's probably too long. Um, this also, you know, time constraints and everything. Um, but there's no question, uh, apparently, um, the, the pearl millet doesn't release enough nitrogen. Uh, in some cases, it gets sequestered in the biomass during decomposition or something. So uh, combining it with the sun hemp would be an excellent idea because 
the papers I've seen says it works. I mean, first of all, that's the, that's the first thing. The second thing is that sun hemp is used. I know personally a couple of different farmers that use it, but they only use it once in a while and it's just for uh, breaking nematode cycles. Yeah, basically is what it is. Um, but uh, it would definitely, um, I think you'd have to because, you know, adding, what is it, 120 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare you could avoid that maybe putting in the sun hemp. So I'm going to try to expand on that too. If I can maybe cut something out of the paper and include a section on intercropping, I think it would make my case uh, a little bit stronger. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.